live stream. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, we are not going to be broadcasting a live stream this morning. Uh, George is going to, instead of just videotaping the sermon, he's going to videotape the entire service. So, uh, people at home are probably going to be wondering what's going on. But uh, I will send out an email of apology after church is over, and, uh, and then they can watch it later. But I'm glad that you are all here. Thank you so very much for coming. And I really want to welcome Kathy Peterson back to worship. Uh, she called me this week and she said, I think I'm ready to come back and do you need a liturgist? I thought, yeah! <laughs> so anyway, um, thank you very much, Kathy, for, yep. for jumping you. right back in after such a long time. That and we've... thank you and your team for doing what you've done. Oh, well, you're very welcome. I would uh, remind you once again that Pastor Kathy is coming back next Sunday. She's still in Florida, uh, enjoying this week with Rick. He went down and joined her. So we hope that they have a wonderful time and we'll keep them in our prayers. I would ask that you fill out your Connect card and place it in the offering plate today so that we can take a record of who is here. And uh, also, if there's any prayer requests or any messages that you need to leave for the pastor, um, just put them on there as well. Um, today is uh, Native American Ministries Sunday in the United Methodist Church, and we'll be seeing a video on that in just a couple of minutes. And I would encourage you, if you uh, would like to give a donation to Native American Ministries, you may use the envelope that's in your offering or in your bulletin and drop it in. If it's a check, uh, just make it out to the church and then put NAMS or Native American Ministries in the memo line. And is there anyone here um, who did the MS walk? I don't see see anyone. There was a, um, some of our families are out of town. Uh, the Raisbecks did, and uh, the Dulmeses were there, and the Petersons, um, uh, Steve Blake, and there, oh, there you go. You'll see a picture. Uh, anyway, that was our team from this year, and I was going to ask them to come up and tell us a little bit about it. Kathy, would you, do you want to share anything about the MS walk? Do you have to happen to know? Well, there were a couple of people I'm in there. Can you be on the mic? Oh, please. there were a couple of people in that picture that I wasn't quite sure if it's because the kids have grown so much in two years. <laughs> <laughs> but um, some children that I didn't recognize. But um, for, I, I was tickled to see the team, the size that we had. And um, so far, we've raised about $690. Our goal was $1,400 this year. But Karen and I both know of people that are in the midst that haven't donated yet. And also, I, I was going to check and I forgot, I think we can donate like into June if you mm -hmm. feel like it. So we can keep it going. And Karen seems to think we might get to our goal from what she's think, heard and I heard. I think we will because yeah. one of our donors gets an employer match. And so with that, and then the two people we know of for sure that mm -hmm. are going to donate, we, I think, are going to hit our goal. So. And that's the first time we've had a matching like that. Yes. And I'll have to remember next year to tell people, don't forget if you're working, check with your company, because there are companies that will match whatever you, you know, pick up yourself. So, But just thanks to everybody that donated also. and um, I. It was, uh, everybody seemed to have a good time, so. Yes, thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Does anyone have anything that they need to bring up before we start? Could I ask a question? Yeah. Since you're not live streaming, could those, I can't, I'm seeing spots on the paper from those two lights, would it be bad to? Oh, okay, yeah, the, those, it's right, um, about right to, on the otherwise, wall there. otherwise, I have spots on my stuff I can't get yeah. into. There you go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Much better. Thank you. All right. Um, then let's go ahead and watch our Native American Ministries video.
operating that God has given us. The kids, at first when they started uh, participating up on the stage, you could barely hear them, but now they're becoming more involved and we really want to be able to give them not only the, the spiritual uh, message from the, from the church, but for them to also maintain their culture and continue with that. Your generous gifts on Native American Ministry Sunday enrich the entire United Methodist Church. Because of your contributions, Native American seminarians prepare for ministry, and Native American urban ministries are nurtured and strengthened. We are God in every step that we take by God and God. The calling that we have in place, the message that we hear through those voices that have gone on in the past, is one that is a holy calling that represents a way of living that can only come from above. The way that we have found all of us in one form or another in the life of the one that we call the Christ. Join us in sharing the joy of giving on Native American Ministry Sunday. Thank you for your generous support. offers a new old commandment that we should love each other. With the incredible power and the unfathomable depth of God's love for us, we can and we must love one another. And it is in this, our love for one another, that the world will know the God we worship. How much of children let us love one another. And then if you remain standing and we're going to sing hymn number 64, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and we're doing verses 1, 3, and 4. Remember the sick, 
visit the imprisoned, clothe the naked, and give water to the thirsty. Fill us with compassion and a desire to serve others in your name. Amen. Well, we don't have children here this morning, and we don't have children watching us on live stream. So, I think we're just going to save this uh, children's message for another time. And uh, let's go to our children's hymn for the month of May, Hymn of Promise, verse 1, number 707. <laughs> belated honeymoon trip. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I was very joyful this morning after all that rain yesterday to look out and see green grass. It was lovely. So I am very happy for that. Lord, to your glory, hear our prayer. If 
not, then let's just take a moment uh, for some silent prayer, and then I will lead us in our prayer for this morning. Let us pray. Lord God, we do bring ourselves to you this morning, grateful that you call us your children. In spite of the fact that we often fall short of your expectations, you continue to love us, to receive us, and to forgive us. We humbly and gladly accept you as Lord of our lives and offer you our praise and thanks this day. Lord, we are most grateful for your Son, Jesus, and for his body and blood that were broken and shed to forgive our sins and make us acceptable in your sight. Thank you for our loved ones, our families. Each day with them is a precious gift. Thank you for our homes and the comfort of warm beds and food to nourish us. Thank you for always being with us through your Holy Spirit in good times and bad. Thank you for never leaving us alone and for giving us hope. Lord, we are grateful for answered prayers and for joys that you bring into our lives. We have shared our joys and concerns with you and one another. We know that you care about each one and that you will answer in ways that are best for us according to your will. You know our thoughts and our hearts. For those things that haven't been expressed in words but that trouble us, Father, we give them to you. We ask your blessing on this church and each one who worships here. Lord, bless the ministries here and multiply the resources. Let this congregation reach out far beyond these walls to touch our neighbors with your love. Let us be a bright light for you as we serve those around us. Father, we ask your hand to touch those who are ill, who are suffering, who are struggling. Raise up your servants to minister to their needs as your hands and feet. Help us all to be mindful of and obedient to your call to service. We ask you to bless Pastor Kathy as she is away. Let this be a time for her to rest and refresh herself in body, mind, and spirit. Be with us this morning as we open your scripture. Open our ears and our spirits to receive all that you have to teach us. We love you, Lord, and we offer to you the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our sermon hymn this morning is from the Faith We Sing, number 2036. Give thanks. We're going to sing it just once through and then go to the second ending.
The scripture reading for today is from chapter 16 of Luke, verses 19 through, four, um, through 31, and it's the Common English Bible Version. There was a certain rich man who clothed himself in purple and fine linen, and who feasted luxuriously every day. At his gate lay a certain poor man named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. Lazarus longed to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. <clears throat> Instead, dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. While being tormented in the place of the dead, he looked up and saw Abraham at a distance with Lazarus at his side. He shouted, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm suffering in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, whereas Lazarus received terrible things. Now Lazarus is being comforted and you are in great pain. Moreover, a great crevasse had been fixed between us and you. Those who wish to cross over from here to you cannot. Neither can anyone cross from there to us. The rich man said, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. He needs to warn them so that they won't come to this place of agony. And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They must listen to them. The rich man said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, that will change their hearts and lives. Abraham said, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Thank you, Kathy. Our scripture this morning is the parable of the rich man and the beggar. And Jesus is teaching his disciples and also other followers and even Pharisees were in the crowd. And what he was talking about was the contrast between self-absorption, thinking about oneself first, and compassion. So we have the story of the two men, a rich man and a poor man, one living on the inside and one living on the outside. Inside was the rich man, and outside was poor Lazarus. Inside, the rich man was dressed in fine linen and dyed a royal purple. Outside, Lazarus was clothed with sores. Inside, the rich man feasted sumptuously every day, and poor Lazarus just yearned for scraps from the rich man's table. Inside, the rich man lived at the very top of the social scale. Outside is Lazarus, who is at the bottom. Inside, the rich man has tons of possessions, but no name. Outside, Lazarus lies there. He has no possessions except for his name. And his name, Lazarus, is the Greek translation of the Hebrew name Eliezer, which means the one whom God helps. In this parable, the promise of Lazarus' name is fulfilled. God helps him. Inside and outside. What marks the boundaries between the two? The gate. A gate can function in two different ways. It can let in or it can keep out. We've already heard that Lazarus desired to go through the gate to eat the scraps from the rich man's table. The question is, will the rich man walk through the gate to come to Lazarus's aid? And the answer is no, he does not. The gate kept the rich man inside and Lazarus outside. Then, both men die, and there is a great reversal. The gate disappears, and in its place is this huge chasm. The men could no longer choose to go in or out. 
They now change places, and Lazarus is carried up to heaven by angels, and he's taken to the bosom of Abraham, and the rich man was cast outside into the flames of hell. Lazarus is now feasting at Abraham's table. The rich man is thirsting for the tiniest drop of water. The chasm can never be crossed. The men's destinations are permanently sealed. Now, why was the rich man sentenced to hell for eternity? What did he do that was so horrible that he deserved such a fate? He wasn't being punished because he was rich. Abraham was very wealthy. It wasn't a case of immorality. Nowhere does the story imply that the rich man was immoral. He never mistreated Lazarus. He never kicked him or chased him away. He never lectured him about getting up and getting a job. The rich man was being punished because of his indifference. Now the key to this story is the gate. It kept one man inside and the other outside. During his life on earth, the rich man refused to walk through the gate to bring help to Lazarus. He knew Lazarus was laying out there. Every time he went in and out of his property, he saw him lying on the ground covered in sores and begging to survive. In verse 24, we learn that the rich man even knew Lazarus' name, but never invited him in or even sent his servants outside with food or drink. Every day he passed Lazarus with a blind eye and deaf ears. He was indifferent to his plight, indifferent to his hunger, indifferent to his needs. He showed no concern or compassion. He was unwilling to live in community with someone different from himself. It never occurred to the rich man that the fate of Lazarus' birth and the fate of his birth could be changed. He never saw Lazarus as a suffering fellow human being, but only as part of the landscape. Even from Hades, the rich man is thinking only of himself. He asks Abraham to send Lazarus to him like a servant to bring him water to quench the fire in his tongue. At this point, he still doesn't get it. He still sees Lazarus as inferior to himself and someone to do his bidding for him. It's not until Abraham tells him that that great chasm cannot be crossed, that the rich man can never leave hell and go to heaven, that starts the rich man thinking and realizing what he had done. But it was too late. Then the rich man asks Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers not to make the same mistake. And Abraham replies, their hearts are already hardened. Even receiving a message from someone who came back from the dead is not going to be enough to unharden their hearts. Because of the rich man's indifference and lack of compassion, he missed the kingdom of God. He had the best of everything. He lived sumptuously. His wealth no doubt supported the local economy in a significant way. But because he refused to see the suffering that was right in front of him, he could also not see the gate that led to heaven. Matthew 7 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through that. But small and narrow is the gate that leads to life, and only a few find it. God has provided us with many gates for us to walk through, not gates to shut people out. While we are still on earth, he places gates in front of us to freely walk in and out, to be in relationship with others, especially those who are poor and sick and suffering or in need. 
people like Lazarus who are different or invisible to society. Those are the people that God wants us to cross the gate to them. He calls us to enter into community with all people, to invite all into the fold with compassion and caring. Here on earth, no one should be left out. God's gate is one of grace and love and is open wide for all of his children. But one day, that gate is going to become a chasm that can never be crossed. This parable is a warning to all of us, not to walk around with eyes that cannot see or ears that cannot hear. Father Henry Nouwen, a Roman Catholic priest, shares his philosophy about why God allows some people to suffer from poverty and disease. He writes, I am more convinced in the deepest sense that God holds a very special preference for the poor and the sick among us. He gives to us the poor in spirit for our conversion. In their poverty, they reveal God to us and thereby keep us close to the gospel. Our spirituality should come from living deeply with the poor." Unquote. There was an article printed in the Wall Street Journal about a woman named Lucy who lived in a mansion in a very wealthy section, uh, suburb of New York City. However, the area around her was very poor. One day, her church congregation decided to send out a, volunteers to, a team of volunteers to the poorest suburbs to distribute food and clothing to the homeless. Four church members made the trip into the city, Lucy and two other women, and an elderly man. The night was bitterly cold. They packed their van with hot food, with soup and cocoa and sandwiches and sleeping bags and blankets. When they made their first stop in Central Park just after midnight, 50 homeless people came and surrounded the van. Lucy was really frightened. All I could think is what my friends would say I was crazy to do this, that they're all drunks or crazy or drug addicts. She was too scared to get out of the van. But she did pass close through the window. And when she did, she saw these people, and they were taking the clothes and thanking her and holding them up and, uh, is this the right size for me? And if not, they would turn and give it to someone else. They were sharing what they had been given were willing to give it away to help someone else. Everyone was gracious and appreciative. And Lucy couldn't believe what she was seeing. She thought, oh my gosh, they're just people. They're just people like me who just don't have as much as I do. Well, the night went on, and as the van moved around the city, Lucy got more bold. At the next stop, she was the hostess for the hot chocolate cart. She got out of the van. She passed hot chocolate to people. And then she even ventured under the overpasses and started handing out clothing to the men living there. When she returned to her home, she spent the remainder of the evening crying and laughing. It had been a very emotional experience. That night, she went to a dinner party and she told others of what she had experienced. Some, a few, were genuinely moved. Others told her, you are crazy. You are feeding people who come and burglarize our homes. Now they really aren't gonna go out and get any jobs. That shocked her. It shocked her to know that a few days before she would have probably answered the same thing. Some of her friends looked different at her and some of her friends wouldn't talk to her anymore but she thought I think I have lost some of my boundaries those homeless hungry and destitute people that we spend so much time and energy trying to avoid are just people like me down on their luck Lucy had walked through the gate and by doing so it gave her a new perspective on life 
Who's the Lazarus at your gate? Is it the homeless person asking for a handout on a city street? Is it a lonely teenager who lives down the street or a young mother trying to keep her family together after her husband has abandoned her? Do we remember the elderly who no one visits? Or a jobless guy who's been left behind by a culture that no longer values his talent? What about the person who's sitting a few pews away from you who has just received a devastating report from their doctor? Do we really notice what people around us are going through? The discrepancy between the rich man's lifestyle and Lazarus' life struggle was appalling. In spite of that, the rich man found it possible to just walk right past Lazarus as if he were invisible. Who's sitting at our gate? Do you allow the idea that the poor will always be with us to numb you to their presence? Many people do. Do we live for ourselves, for our comfort and security, our salvation, or do we live for others? The prophet Micah, in chapter 6, verse 8, provides the correct answer. He said, He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Jesus carries this message into the New Testament when he tells us to feed the hungry, visit the prisoner, and clothe the naked. To love God is to love our neighbor. In spite of our differences or because of them, we are called to be in community with others, with everyone, with those who are different from us. And God helps us do that by providing gates that we can walk through. The eternal question to be asked is simply, how are the neighbors doing? Their welfare must be of genuine concern to us because it is of great concern to God. There was a man who went to visit in a home where there were several children. And trying to relate to the kids, he asked one of the girls about her doll collection. Which is your favorite doll, he asked. Promise not to laugh if I tell you, she questioned. He promised not to laugh, so the little girl got up and, and came back with a worn out, tattered doll that looked like a refugee from the refuse pile. There was a crack in her arm and her nose was missing. There were marks all over her body and she didn't have any hair. The man didn't laugh, but unable to hide his surprise, he asked, why do you love this one the most? And she replied, because she needs it the most. If I didn't love her, nobody would. Self-absorption and indifference are sins that afflict all of us to one degree or another, and yet we rarely talk about it or even think about it. We become so preoccupied with our own cares and concerns that we don't see the problems around us. Or perhaps we see them and we feel bad, but then we don't do anything about it. There are lots of gates that are put before us. They may shut us out of community with others. Maybe you struggle with the husband-wife gate. God has given some of us the gift of marriage, a beautiful gift which can bring us into community with one another. But sometimes the marriage gate gets shut, locked up tight, perhaps because of foolish things said or done, perhaps because of, child, because of childhood wounds. The good news is that marriage is still a gate, not a chasm. It can still be opened up and walked through. There are other gates, relationships with loved ones that may be broken, problems with a coworker. There's enough grace in the kingdom of God that allows us to open those gates and reach out with God's help. When the rich man asked Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers not to make him the same mistake that he did, Abraham replied that 
Even receiving a message from someone who came back from the dead would not unharden the hearts. There would be no second chance. There are no bridges between heaven and hell. They would be forever outside of God's eternal blessing. Who's at our gate? There was a time, spiritually speaking, when each one of us was a beggar lying at the gate totally helpless. And Christ noticed us. And he loved us just the way we are. As we remember that truth and the compassion of his grace, Christ calls us to look around and see someone who needs our attention, our compassion, and our love. When we show Christ-like compassion to others, they will remember how it felt to be on the receiving end of that agape, or unconditional love of Christ. And that will give them the desire to reach out and help someone else. And that original act of kindness then goes on and on and on. But we can't be part of the chain of love if we don't take time to look around and minister to those around us. Don't be like the rich man who will forever be remembered as the person who refused to notice. Look around you today and find someone who needs love. Jesus is the Word of God. He came back from the dead with a message of repentance and a gift of salvation. The Gospel accounts of Jesus serve as a spiritual blueprint on how we are supposed to live and love and serve. We are to be generous, to care not just for our families and loved ones, but also for strangers, the poor, the orphan, and the hungry. We are to show compassion for all. To love God is to love and show compassion to the humanity that he loves. So what about those folks at our gate? What will happen to them? According to the parable, one day they will die. And on that day, they will be embraced with the waiting arms of a loving God who will speak to them the words, Welcome home. Let us pray. Dear Lord, open our eyes and our hearts to see the needs of others. Give us hearts full of love and compassion. Help us to be rich in the things of heaven and give us a generous spirit that we may freely share with others the treasure you have given to us. All glory and honor be yours, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Help Us Accept Each Other, 560 in the hymnal. We will sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Please stand as we sing. Thank you.